everything that we're a part of, we have proclaimed that as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. So we serve you, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We're not saved because we serve you. We're saved because you served us by giving your life for us. But we worship you, praise you, and, and thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. And as with glad hearts tonight, we get into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in chapter 9, Genesis. And... Uh, this is a place where you get new instructions after the flood and arrangements. And, and uh, we talk about the sin of Noah and his sons. Why are we going to talk about that? I mean, uh, Noah had found grace in, in the sight of God. But remember this, that the Bible said in Romans 5 that sin reigned from Adam to Christ. Amen? So uh, the truth about it is just because he... he destroyed the world does that mean that's the end of sin Nah. you know i talked talk to a guy the other day he said i bought a brand i remember one of some brand new car already i had to bring it back to the shop i said if it's made with human hands it's going to have problems and uh, this world that has humans in it as long as humans are here uh, we're going to have problems amen and so we come to a new beginning the Everything that was living, but Noah and his family and the, and the animals in the ark uh, were destroyed by the flood. You know, it's amazing. We live our lives by this word. Today, I renewed my tags and, and uh, for the bus out there, not my tags, but the church's bus. And she goes, oh, this is a church thing. I said, yeah. She goes, the gal there at the license office says, I don't go to church. I don't believe in church. I said, that's okay. I don't argue with people. There's no reason to argue with them. And uh, she goes, first place, you guys believe in people raising from the dead. Yeah, you mean Jesus? Yeah, nobody raises from the dead. And I said, uh, have you never seen people raised from the dead? She goes, of course not. So you don't believe anything that you can't see? No, I believe in some things we can't see. Okay, then you do believe that things could exist that, that you haven't seen. No, I don't believe that. Oh, then you... It can't be both ways. Either you believe in the, what you can see or you don't believe in what you can see. or that, There's something wrong here. Well, I'm just not going to church. Okay, I believe that. That's fine. But the reason, why didn't I argue with them? You can't argue with people like that. And it don't any good, do any good to argue with people anyway. We want to live an example. So I started joking with her. She had a smile on her face. I left her with a smile. You know why? I, I, don't, I didn't have my cards with me when I walked in that I, I know I have sinned a great sin <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm going to talk to you for just a moment before we get started in the scripture There's, there are seven great dispensations and uh, and I'm going to give them to you real quick so if you're going through scripture you'll understand this the first dispensation was the dispensation of innocence it began, began right after creation and it ended with the fall of Adam. Why did it end with the fall of Adam? Innocence was gone, wasn't it? Then you had the dispensation of, of human conscience. That began after the fall of Adam, and it ended with the Tower of Babel. Man erected a tower. tower. Man wanted to get to God. Man thought he was as big as God. Then you had the dispensation of human government. That began with the destruction of the Tower of Babel and ended with the flood of Noah's day. And you'll see some of these dispensations, they overlapped each other. But the dispensation of promise was the next one. It began after the flood of Noah's day. And then we find the Abrahamic covenant was given during this same uh, dispensation. The children of Israel went into captivity in Egypt and ended with Israel uh, being released from captivity in Egypt. Then you had the dispensation of the law, the law of Moses. Began after the children of Israel were released from Egypt. Ten commandments were given to Israel. Man could not keep them. When Jewish believers at Jerusalem began going back to the law as a requirement for salvation, Peter refuted him. In Acts 15, 10, he said, Now therefore, why ye tempt ye God to put a yoke on the yoke, talk about the law, upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear since Jesus Christ kept the law he took it out of the way 
Colossians 2.14 says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. We're no longer under the Ten Commandments, are we? It ended with Jesus on the cross. Then the dispensation of grace, the one we're living in now. Uh, people said, you know, they look at the statement that was made that said uh, the, uh, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so they'll try to teach that what Jesus taught was grace, but Jesus taught the law. Because he's called to the lost house of Israel, it would have been a terrible thing for him to try to reach Israel uh, by coming against the law. He didn't do that. As a matter of fact, he explained the law in a way that, that Moses could not because Moses may not have understood the law, but he gave it. But Jesus understood the law. And he let them know that you're trying to be right by God through the law, but it was never designed for that. So we're living here now in the dispensation of grace or the, the church age. It began on the day of Pentecost, and it will end at the rapture of the church. And what do I mean by that? The people that are left here after the church is raptured, they'll not be living under the dispensation of grace. They'll be, they'll, they'll be living here on this earth. You still be, get saved. Uh, the Holy Spirit will still be here. But uh, the, we'll, the next dispensation is the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it'll begin after the second coming of Jesus. When it looks like Satan has won the final victory, Jesus Christ will descend from the clouds. Satan and all the demons will be bound for a thousand years. Please don't ask me. I don't understand it. I've never understand why he binds Satan for a thousand years and then sets him free. I don't get it. And I don't get it why when he is set, set free, how he'll deceive people after people have been living in paradise. I just wanted you to know the seven dispensations because we're living in the church age right now. It's the dispensation of grace given to people, given to this world so that we might lead people to Christ. It's like opening the door. Say, come on in without price. Come on in and enjoy the benefits of relationship with God. Now, let's start with Genesis 9-1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Uh, we know that that was given to somebody else, wasn't it? Who was that given to, to be fruitful and multiply? Adam. He had the, he, he had the instructions to do that. Uh, and I can't tell you why Adam sinned against God, but I don't want you to judge him too harshly. Uh, I like what one expositor of the Word said, don't be too hard on Adam because if Adam had done it, you would. Amen. Amen. <laughs> So I'm just telling you, that's the, that's the thing. Today we're living in a time of overpopulation, and, and uh, uh, so we understand what it is to replenish, uh, be fruitful and multiply, but we don't understand quite the way we should that our job was to make this, this earth a better place while we're here. Let me tell you, when we are raptured out of here, some people say, why do things go back? Because we are the, what the Bible calls uh, when he that is, hinders is called out. We're the ones that are hindering evil right now. The church is. Somebody said, well, the Holy Spirit will be gone when we're gone. Well, the Holy Spirit won't be gone or nobody gets saved. The Holy Spirit will still be here when we're raptured out of here. But we're the one that's hindering evil. Can you imagine what it would be like if all of a sudden there was no church? Let me go ahead and s tell you this. People that say they love God but put their stamp of approval on the terrorist activities that I'm seeing all over the United States... Uh, they are greatly deceived. You can't love God and want to hurt people. Amen? And uh, so even though there's a cause that they're standing for, uh, if, if even the church has been caught in that in years past. Their great cause spread the gospel, so you have the great crusades where they're killing people that don't believe. I mean, that don't make any sense, does it? Uh, I want you to imagine what it was like for... For Noah, real quick here, what was it like to Noah to get off of the to get off of that boat and there's nobody there but him and his family? Now imagine you ever been caught in Kansas City traffic trying to get downtown when a traffic jam, and it's bumper to bumper, and there are times you may say, "Boy, I wish these people were gone." Well, Noah didn't have to worry about that, even if he lived in this day and age. When he got out, there was no traffic jam. There wasn't anybody there. 
Amen? Now imagine what it's like to start civilization and you're it. I'd have probably been sarcastic with the Lord. I don't know. You're telling me to be fruitful and mul multiply? It's just me and my old lady. I mean, how can we fill the earth, you know? What do you think we're capable of here? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyway, it was almost as if you lived in this day and age, you could say to the Lord, you can take down all the traffic lights. There aren't any traffic. But I try to imagine what it's like to get off boat knowing that everybody is dead but you. And uh, then the Lord goes on. He said, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air, upon all that moved upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. A part of the covenant uh, is man's protection and rulership over the animal world. And I take it that before this time, the relationship was different. They stayed on that boat, and the animals didn't eat the men, and the men didn't eat the animals. Amen? The animals came to Noah. They didn't even need to be forced to go to Noah. They came to Noah. They knew. Now the animals were fear and dread men. Man, believe it or not, has been placed in charge of the animal world. Man's treatment of the animal world is pretty a brutal story. Uh, now, don't take me. If anybody's ever watched me eat, you know I'm not a vegetarian. Uh, and, and I told somebody who was a vegetarian inside the church one time, they said, I just think it's the right thing. I said, well, Jesus ate meat. My Lord and Savior ate meat. But I'm just trying to tell you that, uh, uh, that we haven't treated this world that God gave us control over very well. Uh, when people have this senseless slaughter of animals, uh, they're not treating this world in the way that God would have us to treat it. Uh, many, many years ago, the buffalo in the plains were almost completely exterminated. And many of the carcasses were just left there because they would just take the hides. I mean, we didn't treat, well, you know, uh, we have, uh, I'm not a hunter, but I know some things you shoot and they die. Some things you shoot and they crawl away and you got to find them. And the suffering of animals is not something I'm for. And I'm not a big ant. Don't think that. There are no dogs or cats in my house. Uh, but still, we're responsible for what's happening in this world. Amen? Don't go somebody and tell somebody, well, Pastor Bob is for the gr uh, Green New Deal. I'm not. I'm not going to quit taking planes or driving my car and all that stuff so we can drink, eat. I mean... Uh, breathe better. I'm not going to do that. Then he goes on to say, every moving thing that liveth, God says, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Before it wasn't, but now it's meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. So God has given us charge over this world. He gave Noah charge over this world. Before the flood, God gave to man the green earth, the plant life to eat. Now he tells Noah that he's able to eat animal life animal life. Now, there's some people that believe in eating nothing but vegetables. The Lord be with thee. <laughs> uh, but I like burgers and steaks and things like that. I heard a guy talking about shooting quail one time, and he said, I like to shoot quail because sometimes you shoot them, though, and they kind of crawl away, and you got to find them. But then I wish there was a better way because the idea of that animal, just that bird just suffering, it's pretty bad for me. But anyway, and he said, But flesh with the life thereof, in the fourth verse, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. In other words, the blood should be drained out, brain drained out. The blood speaks of life. You take a life and spill that blood, it, 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 it has no life in it. That's, it. The Bible says that the life is in the blood. Now, you need to make sure that it's really dead. People enjoy the sport of hunting. There's nothing wrong with that but ensure that the animal is killed in a merciful manner. You know, not like the story of the guy that went out and was talking to this old boy and raised pigs. He said, man, this is my prize pig right here. And, and the guy said, well, your prize pig? Why is he limping like that? He said, a good pig like that, you can't eat all at once. <laughs> That's terrible. 
And in the fifth verse, it says, And surely your blood, the, your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Interesting statement. Uh, but not so new to those people that lived on the frontier. Certain animals we encounter, such as skunks and possums, may be rabbit or disease-carrying rodents, pose a real danger to man. Now, the fifth and last statement to the new covenant is most amazing. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man, shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Now, let me tell you, that it's one of the greatest statements about capital punishment. Did you know that? My daughter Angela did a study on capital punishment, and she found out even a small percentage of people that gave their lives in ca capital punishment, uh, when they found out later on they were innocent, I think that's terrible. But the principle of, ca I don't even understand, when you've had 30 witnesses see somebody dra pull a gun and kill somebody, the Bible said they ought to be killed, not kept alive forever and doing a, uh, appealing everything, you know, making appeals to the court and living so we support them forever. But once they're proven guilty, they should, that shouldn't be cruel either. They just put them in firing squad and shoot him. Be done with him. You have people now that they don't want to die by lethal injection. They think it's a terrible thing, so don't. Here's the point. God literally puts his stamp of approval on taking the man's blood who's taken another man's blood. Amen? He did, he, he's given the principle for government and protection of man. He gives the government the right to capital punishment. And I know there are a lot of people that don't believe in it. It's the same God that said, Thou shalt not kill. But literally, thou shalt not kill not, meant not to murder without cause. That's what it meant. At another point, we'll find as we're going through the Bible that there was established cities of refuge so if somebody had taken another life they could find refuge until the 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 elders of that city decided whether he had taken it rightfully or not there is a time to rightfully take another's life if somebody comes inside of my house and going to hurt my wife they're dead or in a mackerel you understand what i'm saying why god's given me the job of protecting my family and god to take a dim view if a man won't take care of his family or a woman take care of his family you know, uh, uh, and frankly, I'd rather put up with some men protecting their family than some of the women. You don't want to mess with a woman's child. I'll tell you what, she'll get you. Uh, so I'm going to tell you this capital punishment is scriptural, and that's the basis of government. If the government has no right to punish sin, then, w and then how does it govern? The same Christ who said, turn the other cheek, don't return evil for evil. People say don't return evil for evil means that you can't have capital punishment. Capital punishment is not evil. Murder without cause is. The same God that said thou shalt not kill is the one that told Saul to go and kill all the Amalekites, everything, living thing in it. So we need to let the word, uh, we need to rightly decide, uh, discern the word. Amen. So he said, whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall, shall his blood be shed. Uh, uh, and then he goes, he says, and you be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. It's a repetition of God's instruction in verse 1. God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, and I behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed with, after you. Now I like covenants that God shed and the signs of the covenant uh, because God gives a covenant and then he gives us a reminder of those things and with every living creature that is with you of the fowl of the cattle and every beast of the earth with you from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth God's creatures are included in the covenant and he said I will establish my covenant with you neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by the waters of a flood neither shall there be more flood to destroy the earth that's God's promise. And what's the token of the covenant? He's cut a covenant, but he's going to give us a sign or a token of that covenant. What is it? The rainbow. See, God had a rainbow long before How do I say it? Yeah. 
You know, it's a symbol of the the gay gay rights movement or something now. The, the, but I guess that wasn't God. God didn't say, I'm going to give you a covenant so gays will feel good about their sin. That's not what he said. He said, I'm going to give a covenant. I'm, I'm cutting a covenant with you. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature. Did he just make the covenant with man or did he say this includes every living creature? That is with you. For perpetual, perpetual generations, I, d I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a token of covenant between me and the earth. It's a real sacrament. That is, it's a token of a covenant. And God is doing it. I love that about God. Even we'll find out later when he cuts covenant with uh, Abraham, uh, God says to Abraham, as for me, this is what I'll do. As for me, how many people know God will keep his part of the bargain? And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I'll remember my covenant that is between me and you and everything, creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I'll look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. God says, I'll look upon it. I'll remember. God didn't say that you'd see it. He said he'd see it. He said, you know, I love this about God. God decides, I love this. God is the only eternal being there is, and he can decide what he's going to remember and what he's going to forget. Did you know God decides what he's going to know and what he's not going to know? That's why sometimes we'll find God saying, uh, asking like he's surprised by the actions of somebody. If he's all-knowing, was he really surprised? Well, the only way he could be is if he has the ability to know what he wants to know and not. Somebody said, well, I don't understand that about God. Do you know why you don't understand it? You're not God. So he said he'd look upon it and be an everlasting covenant between God and every living creature on all flesh and that's on the earth. And that ought to be an encouragement whenever you look at a rainbow. I'm serious, man. Get, get in the habit of finding the principles of God evident in what we see. Every time you ought to see that rainbow, you ought not say, well, honey, that's just so beautiful. And you ought to say, you know what? Look at God's covenant. He's reminding us. He'll never cover this earth with water and destroy all flesh again. I love it. And God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I've established between me and all flesh upon the earth. It's God's covenant, not merely with Noah, with all flesh. Man, that rainbow could be called a sacrament because a sacrament is always a visible sign of the uh, certain promises. The, the Passover feast, the brazen serpent, Gideon's fleece, and our day baptism and the Lord's Supper are such signs of God's covenant that we remember. When we take the Lord's Supper, Supper we're remembering the, the, the covenant that God has set with us, that he has taken our sins and thrown them as far as the east is from the west, and that by his stripes we are healed, and we experience a sign of that covenant. Amen? One man said, God's eye of grace and our eye of faith meet in the sacraments, the, 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 the proof of the covenants we see. And so the merit is what the sign speaks of. Now the rainbow is God's answer to Noah's altar. Remember the first thing that Noah did when he came off the boat? He set up an altar. We're going to find that about Abraham too. Wherever Abraham sojourned, they set up an altar. Man, we ought to remember that. Uh, I spoke with somebody earlier telling you, talk, try to remember the four priorities of your life. Number one is your personal relationship with God that's your first priority somebody said well, I gotta take care of my family no that's your second priority first one is your re personal relationship with God because the other three after the personal relationship with God only work because you have that personal relationship with God so number one is your personal relationship with God number two is taking care of your family amen when your kids walk into a room they ought to occasionally see a Bible they ought to see you talking about the Bible. It was a commandment that God gave the parents of the children of Israel 
that at their tables and everywhere else, they would, uh, they, they, they'd go over what God had promised them. When a man came out of the ark after the flood and all the sinners were dead, does that mean that there was no more sin on the earth? No. Well, let's, look, let's look and see. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. And why is Ham's son Canaan mentioned here? Two reasons. One reason we're going to see in a moment. Another reason is that when Moses wrote this record, the people of Israel were traveling across the land of Canaan. There are three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began in, in verses 19 to 21, and Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered with his tent. Years ago, I saw an expositor said, well, he was drunk because he didn't know wine would make him drunk. Shut up. The hard fact of the matter is that Noah got drunk, and that's his sin. There's no satisfactory excuse. Can I tell you, you don't have a satisfactory excuse for sin in your life. God's not only forgiven all of our sin, he's broken the power of sin over us. He's defeated the enemy, and he's made us right in his sight. We, we have no excuse to sin. Amen? Uh... All I can say is that this is a new beginning, a new world, but it's old sin, and it's still there. And the incident reveals this is given an answer to a big question. In, Ham, in verses 22 through 24, and Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the name. Oh, I love this group of scriptures. It teaches such a great principle. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were, were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from the wine and knew what his younger son had done him. Well, what did his younger son do? Him? He shamed him. His younger son should have just grabbed something and covered his father's nakedness without looking at him. Amen. And so, and he said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall be, shall he be unto his brethren. And I, I have you note that God said, cursed be Canaan. He does not put a curse on him. He just said, you're going to live a life that's cursed. Uh, a question keeps arising, is the curse of Ham upon the dark races? Did you know people used to talk about there's a curse on people that are dark complected? And can I tell you something? That's religious gobbledygook. The coloration of the skin, the pigment that's in the, the, the skin uh, is there because of sunlight from the outside, not because of sin from within. The darker ra uh, races usually came from hotter sunlit places, and, and our bodies adapt to that. And we're only given a bare record here, but we recognize Canaan is, is, Canaan is mentioned for a, def uh, for a purpose. The teaching, and let me say this again, it has nothing to do with the color. It's not a curse of color put on the human race. I remember one time when a guy grabbed that scripture and, and, was, and was telling me, by golly, God doesn't like black people. I said, are you kidding me? God loves everybody. And everybody came uh, from Noah and Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's what it was. We're going to see a little bit more about that. But I said, if, if God didn't like, uh, 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 I'll tell you what God don't like. He don't like prejudice. I remember when Miriam came and, and complained about uh, uh, Moses being married to an Ethiopian lady and was struck with leprosy. Did you know you don't get to come against the man of God because he married a black woman? The Ethiopians weren't pasty white. They were black. Can I tell you this today, and, and for people who watch this on the Internet, uh, you may be all angry if you have a relative that I have a friend of mine even that tells me, man, any white man that marries a black woman or, or, or a black man marries a white woman, 
God can't put a stamp of approval on that. I said, God don't even care about it. If you found somebody that loves you, they're in love with God, and they're called into your life, the color of their skin don't mean anything at all. The old song says, red and yellow, black and white, they're precious in his sight. Amen. But I want to tell you something. Uh, why did God give us a record of the sin of Noah? Why? Well, if man had written the book of Genesis, he would have done one of two things. He either would have covered up the sin of Noah because that's our nature. <laughs> but see, God said that the things that we read in the Old Testament are examples to us. First of all, we have these things, the record of Noah, to encourage the children of Israel in entering the land of Canaan during the time of Moses and Joshua. And let them know that God had pronounced a curse upon Canaan. He had pronounced his judgment upon the race. All you had to do is read the rest of the Old Testament and secular history to discover the fulfillment of this judgment. The Canaanites have pretty much disappeared. And secondly, God had a further reason for recording the incident of no one's sin. In Romans 15, 4, we read, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the Scriptures it might have hope. Uh, I want to tell you something. I don't find in the Scriptures anywhere where somebody having a drink was ever a problem, but being a drunkard was always a problem. And I still have friends today that They'll get mad about something and they'll go to the bottle and they'll get drunk. Then the next day they're complaining about how sick they are. And I compassionately say, hey, it's your own fault, you ignat. You knew what was going to happen. You've done it enough times in the past. You can't turn to the bottle. You can't turn to drugs. You can't turn to pornography. You can't turn to... Let me tell you, when, when you are feeling at your worst, I guarantee you the devil is going to show up to try to get you to cover it with some other way than your relationship with God. I tell, I tell couples that for years, my wife and I have told couples, if you're having trouble in your relationship, I guarantee the next step is God it, it, going to be watching over you. But, but the devil is going to come and bring somebody to tell you what you always wanted to hear from your spouse. Amen? That's what he'll do. Well, don't make any excuses for Noah. The very fact is that Noah got drunk. And Christians ought not get drunk. People that know God shouldn't get drunk. I've even told people in leadership here, if you have a drink, you go out somewhere and you have a drink, uh, don't put it, don't take a picture of you drinking on Facebook because God's not mad at you because you had a drink, but he's not happy with you being out of control and getting drunk. So don't put a, f it'll cause your brother to stumble if you take a picture of yourself holding up that beer and putting it on Facebook. Then somebody with a weaker conscience can stumble. Not the stronger conscience. The weaker conscience is the one that stumbles. Now, I don't get drunk because I was an alcoholic. And I spent enough time in that lifestyle. And I want to be like Paul. He said, all things are lawful for me, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. Amen? Uh, God's concerned about training you and I. And uh, Noah didn't take the training very well. And he said, Blessed be the God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Shall, God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Why? He dishonored his father. Did you know honor means a lot to God? We're to honor one another. If you study the scriptures, you'll find out we're to honor those people that we serve. We're to honor those people that are equals, and we're to honor those people that serve us. Honor flows all directions, doesn't it? And Noah, after the flood, uh, and Noah lives after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Do what? That's a lot of years. My wife used to say, well, I want to live life, but I want, I, I'm not one of these people who lives with 110. You don't, you, you don't have any quality of life at 110. She don't want to live that long. 
Me, I want to get as much time to harass people as I possibly can. Uh, the sun, the, really, the theme of, of the 10th ch chapter we're starting in is about the sons of Japheth, sons of Ham, sons of Shem. And it's a, it's a chapter of genealogies, and, and for a lot of people, it's not, very, it's not very long, but it's rather boring. And these are the generations of the sons of Noah, it'll tell us in the 11th verse, of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. Uh, we see the genealogy of Japheth in verses 2 through 5, the genealogy of Ham in 6 through 20. And uh, this was the outstanding people at that beginning. And finally, the ge genealogy of Shem. As a matter of fact, if you'll remember, uh, um, well, let me just get on with this. The sons of Japheth, let's talk about this. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, and, and Mesesh, and Tiras. And uh, according to one theologian, A.S.S. Miller uh, said these are the Scythians, the Slavs, Russians, Bulgarians, Bohemians, Poles, Slovaks, and Croatians come from Magog. The people from India and the Iranic uh, races, Medes, Persians, Afghans, and Kurds came from Madai. From Javan, we have the, the Greeks, Romans, and the, and the Romance nationalities as French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian. Coming from Tyrus are the Thracians, the Teutons, the Germans, the, the, the North Germanic or the Scandinavians, uh, and the West Germanic from which come the High German, the Low German, and then the, the Angles and Saxons from the Jews, the Angles, Saxon race, the English people. And so you say all that and say, so what? I don't know. But it tells us that we all had beginning somewhere. I can't go into the whole chart, but I'll tell you that's it. Now, sons of Ham. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizram, and Foot, and, and Canaan. Ham had, three, had other sons, but the curse was only upon Canaan. And why was it not put on the others? I don't have any idea. Did you, did you remember what the key to this is? What God don't tell us? We don't need to know. Uh, from Ham's son, Cush came the Africans, the Ethiopians, the Egyptians, and the Libyans. And all these races are the Hamitic races. And then the sons of Cush. And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord, he began to be a mighty one on the earth. And, you know, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That doesn't mean that he was a wild game hunter, but it, but it does mean uh, uh, he was a hunter of men's souls. And the beginning of his kingdom was, was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna and the, and the land of Shinar. He was the founder of those great cities in the land of Shinar. Nimrod was quite a story, which you can get from secular history. Alexander Hislop, in his book, The Two Babylons, gives them background, which, which we're not going to talk about here. But uh, it was he who attempted to bring together the human race after the flood in an effort to get them united into a nation which he could become the great world leader. He was the rebel, the founder of Babel, the hunter of souls of men. Uh, did you know we still have people that want to control and, and take possession of people's souls in their mind, will, and emotions? They want to take control people. We still have world leaders that try to do that very thing. The first great civilization came out of the sons of Ham. We need to recognize. It's easy to, to fall uh, into the old patterns that we were taught in school. And now the black man is, is wanting more study of his race. And I don't blame him. I think if somebody is an African-American, they need to f study. Find I think everybody ought to study. You know, uh, my roots are in Germany. And so I'd like to know more about that. Again, my wife doesn't want to know anything about her beginnings. We, you know, we are proof that two people this different can really be madly in love with each other. <laughs> and you know why our marriage works so well, right? Because I figured out a long time she's right and I'm wrong. If you do that, guys, it's a lot better. Uh, the story, the beginning of the black man uh, headed up the first two great civilizations that headed on the earth. They weren't second-class citizens. They headed the, some of the greatest civilizations on the earth. 
They were the sons of Ham. Nimrod, Nimrod was the son of Ham. And, uh, and we find this line. We're going to turn now to the line that led to Abraham and then to the nation of Israel and find the coming of Christ. It's this line we'll follow through the Old Testament. The 10th chapter of Genesis is a very remarkable chapter, and you can find some great things in it. But you know what? I'm like most of you. When we get to the begats, But I have found some interesting things when I follow some of the gene genealogies. Uh, Seventy nations are listed in chapter 10. Fourteen of them are from Japheth. Thirty of them come from Ham. If you give a different, con th th that ought to give you a different conception of the black man at the beginning. He was never designed to be a slave. He was never designed to be considered less. Uh, they, they, the largest amount of nations came from them. Because at the beginning it was a black man, the colored races that were prominent. Then the sons of Shem made a tremendous impact on the world during the time of David and Solomon. Let's talk about the sons of Shem. And unto Shem also the father of the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, even to him were children born. And unto Eber was born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, and in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Uh, all that Moses is simply doing here is anticipating the next chapter in which we get the account of the Tower of Babel. But he's setting the ground worth work for this. Remember that he taught this. He taught this to the children of Israel as they were traveling. And these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations and their nations and by these were the nations divided in, in the earth after the flood. Weren't they told to be fruitful and multiply? See, all the nations of the world didn't just show up. In other words, there just wasn't one day God caused more creations. I'm going to create a black man here and a red man here. And red. No, they all came from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Isn't that interesting? The sons of Ham, and the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizram, and Bul, and, and Canaan. Uh, all of these races are Hamitic, and he said, and Cush begat Nimrod. And the, wh what did we say earlier? He became mighty upon the earth. And then un in the 21st verse, it says, Unto Shem, also the father of the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. And listen, Moses is, is setting the thing because we're going to get into the next chapter and we're going to find out the Tower of Babel. So you have, you have the evil that was caused on the earth by, by who? Well, caused by the enemy, but not just the enemy, but because Adam didn't take his rightful place. And we find that sin reigned all the way through, even as the Bible says in Romans, it did reign. And we find that sin reigned to the place where even Noah gets off there and he makes a vineyard and they make wine and he gets drunk. And then one of his sons dishonors him and uh, that son is uh god lets him know there's going to there, you're going to be a cursed nation you're going to be the servant of of the of your other brothers and these are the families of noah after their generation of nation they were the nations divided in the earth you listen you can find out it's a rich study if you really want to take it into the deal but you know what we have so much time on a wednesday night and not enough time to do it. but we're going to get into the next chapter uh, not tonight, but next time on the Tower of Babel and uh, how there was a con confusion. Did you know somebody asked me if he had to confuse their language because they were all in one, what was that? I don't know. He don't tell me what it was. But we're going to find it. It's going to be interesting next week. Don't miss it. We're going to talk about the Tower of Babel and, uh, and how we find God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost talking to each other. Well, let's go down and confuse their languages. And I love this statement about how much power man has in the way that God created him because he's going to say let's go down and confuse him lest they accomplish all that they have set in their hearts to do what can we accomplish when we all get on the same page amen what any questions tonight if it's about the genealogies I'll probably have a dumb look on my face but Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to be together. And we pray, Lord, that we'll, we'll learn from these examples that sin 
has always existed, Lord God. And the devil is constantly trying to get us to stumble and fall. I think the devil even knows he can't get our spirit, but he wants us to destroy our witness. And he wants, to, wants us to sin. He wants us to dishonor the people around us. Uh, and Father, he has never changed his purpose to try to destroy man. But Father, I thank you that we are held in your hands, safe and secure. And the, and the, the worst the devil can do is always to our flesh and never to our spirit, which is yours. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah. Where, oh, you want me to look those back up? One of them is Miller. Yeah, let me get his name. Almost wish you'd asked me that when I was on that page. You just have to cause trouble, don't you? I'll get that for you, and I'll find it here. Oh, H.S. Miller. Uh, he has a master's degree in ethnology, and he's charged, charted the origin of...